Oh, one after the other, after the other. I'm actually walking to the bank and I saw one rise right here, right in front of me and slapped the fly down. It hit the water and he smoked it immediately. And I, I know they're not rising to anything anywhere near this big or even this color, but they're opportunistic fish. Somebody out there is going to say, well, why don't you put on what they are rising to? Well, because what they're rising to is about a size 22 or something. I mean, it's little tiny. And, uh, and if I can get them to go on a bigger fly like this, I can handle them easier. My overall rig is just easier to deal with in general. And these fish, as I keep saying, are just opportunistic feeders. They'll bite a lot of stuff if you just present it well. And uh, what I'm doing is overpowering them with motion. So I slap the fly down, gets their attention when it hits the surface, and then I can just move it just a little bit just to motivate them enough to bite it. And that tends to work real good. I'll show you my fly. Everyone always wants to see the fly here. It's a little uh, soft tackle fly right there. It's kind of an olive green color. It's all slicked down here. You can see it's got a little partridge soft tackle on it. And um, so size 14, I've got it on a 5X tip at 7 and a half, or 5X liter, 7 and a half feet long. The one thing that we did find that was important with our lures there is they had to be small. And that's no secret. The water's really clear. Pretty much always when I have fished in State Forest State Park, whether it be at Lake Agnes or Lake Zimmerman or the creeks themselves, Michigan Creek, uh, it's pretty much always been a battle of how small can I throw because the fish get a good look at everything. Nothing in their natural environment is bigger than just about this big unless they're eating each other, which I'm sure percentage of them are. Um, but the, generally speaking, you're gonna get a lot more bites with really small stuff. So just big enough to present it. When we were fishing in the creek itself, little teeny tiny nymphs on the fly rod was the way to get the most bites. And they don't have to be stupid small, like a size 26 or 28, but certainly if you get up above about a 16, your bites are gonna drop in a hurry. And I'm just watching the tip of the fly line and watching it drift. And if it drifts anything different, I set the hook. I'm not, I'm using it as a strike indicator, which means some trout are gonna get away from you, no question about it, because they're not gonna have it long enough for it to affect the, the tip of the fly line, but, there we go, got that one. <laughs> oh, and I'm still throwing the same wet fly, just for the record, guys. I have not changed flies yet. I'm throwing the same wet fly, and uh, and we're looks like gonna catch the same kind of fish. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come here. Come here. Hold still. Hold still. Come on now. There you go. We'll get you unhooked here. Beautiful little rainbow. Here you go, buddy. And work the current over. Those things are so amazing in the current. The key takeaway from that particular scenario is I think had the sun got higher and brighter or as the sun got higher and brighter those bites would taper off a little bit as the fish pulled a little bit deeper. The beauty of that is as soon as that started to happen for us we just went into the creek itself and now you're into a fundamentally different scenario. Now when you get into the creek now you've got fish that are more positioned instead of just roaming on an open flat like, you, like they do in the lake and just looking for something to eat. Now they're stationed in current in feeding lanes and now you can, you've got a little bit more of a technical challenge, let's say, as far as presenting the fly. There we go. <laughs> Whenever I'm fishing in the stream, guys, uh, my lens of choice pretty much all the time is this, this uh, Costa Green Mirror 580 glass lens. I absolutely love this lens because of the fact that it increases contrast in browns and greens. Hey, hey, come here, come on, hold still. And that means that if you look at this river bottom right here, what I'm looking at is predominantly browns and fish that are green and green all around it. Well, if I can see increased contrast in the browns and greens, it gives me a chance to see what's going on in this pool right here a lot better. He didn't see it. If I can get him, if I can get it right in front of him, he'll get it. Here he goes. No, I missed him. Now I'll get it. Nope. There you got it. <laughs> oh, see what I mean, guys? It's really about just getting a fish to notice, uh, you know, notice your fly in a lot of cases. And we're going to swing him on up here gracefully. Got him. There we go. 
there we go. That one I saw eat. <laughs> and I'm not using a strike indicator, guys. I'm not a big fan of, of quote unquote bobber fishing. It's just a personal preference of mine. So I've got a size 18 pheasant tail on here. And the only way to really know if it's been bit is to pay really close attention to the, what the fish are doing and what the fly is doing. And so I threw up at the head of the pool. You can see the fly drifting with just by watching the leader and then look how fat this rainbow is right here this is one of the fatter ones we've seen today that's a pretty nice rainbow for where we're fishing one of my favorite catches of all time actually happened on that or at least on film happened on that day and it was a trout about that big and so you think well how could that possibly be one of your favorite catches well it's because i like old school fly fishing I'm not a nymph under a bobber guy. Um, I prefer the old school. You've got to know where your nymph is. You've got to know where your line is. You've got to set the hook on instinct. More John Gearock style. Go read Zen and the Art of Nymph Fishing and you'll know what I'm talking about. But at the end of the day, we found two trout that were way back underneath a, an overhanging uh, bank and they were less than the length of my fly rod away. And so the question becomes, how do I get a drift into these fish that are under the bank? And I can see them pull out and grab something and pull back under there. So long story short, I had to throw like 30 feet up the river, curl the leader around on the, uh, as I slapped the fly down and let that nymph get ahead of it and let the current swing it all the way down and around. And all I'm watching is the leader as far out as I can see it as it disappeared. I'm following the fly line. I watched it come all the way around. And about the time the fly should have been somewhere in the, room, in the area of where the fish were, I saw him make one little move, like he picked something up and I set the hook on instinct and sure enough, that little tiny nymph was planted right in the corner of his mouth. Look at these two sitting up against the current right here. I just noticed them. See them under the undercut right there? Two of them. I mean, they're, they're six feet from me and they're nosed all the way under that undercut and I have no idea how I would ever get a presentation in there of any kind. <laughs> I mean, I could, I don't know how I'd get to him with a spinning rod. I don't know how I'd get to him with a fly rod. You'd have to draw him out of there somehow. I mean, I could get a drift to go in underneath there, but they're literally under that undercut. You can see them right there on the gravel. That's a tough deal. If I, if I curl a fly around, I might be able to get it to drift in there and get him to come out and get it. You need it as close to that bank as possible to get a decent drift. I'm gonna use the current to pull my line around there a little bit. There you go, he'll bite this one. Okay, it's going to float right through there. Got him. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. That's how you get that one out from underneath there. <laughs> That, I feel better about that catch than any I've made in a while, guys. And I don't even care if he comes off at this point. He was way under that undercut, and I set that drift up five, six feet upstream so that that thing would have all kinds of time to get deep for one. Come on over here, buddy. And then get underneath that undercut for two. Beautiful. Oop, oop, he wants out of here. There you go. He's going to go right back to where he just came from. You can see that undercut, guys. It is very, very small. He just went right back where he just came from. So if the camera can see that, that's where he just was. So I threw the nymph way up there and let the fly line stay static. And as the nymph drifted down and around, I saw the line disappearing in that undercut. And then I just saw the fish move. And as soon as he moved out just a tiny bit, I went ahead and set the hook on instinct figuring that he probably moved to pick up my fly, and sure enough, he had. Those kind of long technical drifts like that are really, for me, the, the epitome of fly fishing. And if it was like that all the time, I'd fly fish a lot more often. Oh, dude, you said fish come get it? Got that one, there we go. <laughs> one got it, I wasn't quick enough to get the hook set. He spit it out and this other guy grabbed it. That is fun, guys. I, You know, it's fun. I, I loves me some bass fishing. I loves me some saltwater fishing. Um, I love all kinds of fishing, but a three weight and a, a little tiny mountain stream like there's miles of here. Beautiful fish. Here you go, buddy. You can't beat it. I mean, State Forest State Park, 71,000 acres. Let that sink in. 71,000 acres of public property that butts directly to the Raywa Wilderness Area, which is tens of thousands more public property elk by the ton. Colorado's got the biggest elk herd in the country by state. 
moose by the ton in here as well. We already saw beautiful bull moose this morning, grouse, deer, all the other things you come to Colorado for, not to mention horseback riding, mountain biking, even ATVs here. Fantastic place, State Forest State Park. You can stay in a yurt, you can rent a cabin, stay right on the side of the lake, you can stay in a remote outpost, or bring your tent and do it that way as well, or your RV. It's a really, really neat place. Go to Colorado Parks and Wildlife's website if you want more information about this area right here. It's an exquisite place to visit. I recommend you do so.